safe and sound. This is the first Blast Kids Sunday in 2016, and I'm thankful for that. Well, let's begin our service. I would like to invite Lois to do the opening prayer. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for this day, and thank you for giving us this wonderful ch Children's Sunday, Lord. I hope you bless each child today as they praise and glorify your name, Lord. I hope that each child does their best knowing that it's for you and only you. Hope that each and every one of us take something from this sermon and apply it in our daily lives, Lord. Bless each and every child and the families that couldn't make it today, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now I invite our blast kids to lead us in the praise
strong refuge, to which I may resort continually. You have given the commandment to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Blasket Sunday is a very special Sunday. It's just not because it's the first Blasket Sunday of the year. Um, today, kids are going to do a different kind of program. We have seen the kids sing for the Lord, dance for the Lord, uh, play instrument for the Lord, even make crafts for the Lord during the summer project. But today, they're going to deliver God's Word in their own style, I would say. Uh, they're going to present God's word through an experiment or through a demonstration or through a story or presentation or video. It's going to be in their own style. Um, the Black kids are going to sing this song. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Every You shall not take the name of God in red, 
Wait, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor your father and mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit elder tree. You shall not steal. You shall not lie. You shall not covet. Thank you.
and the water represents us, and the candle represents Jesus. So. So the candle represents Jesus and like that's how he's alive. And then this penny represents the sin. So and this jar represents forgiveness. So how we can, how we move closer to God is um, we do this and see all the water is coming inside. I think. <laughs> um, yeah, the water's coming inside. And see the candle lights out, which means like Jesus, he died on the cross for us. Um, and we are now, all the water is away from the sin. So that's how, it, how when Jesus died on the cross, um, we moved closer to God, and then he died on the cross for us. Um, John 1, uh, verse 1 to 9, says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. So every time in your prayer, you should say to God, um, Please forgive all my sins because everybody is thieves. <laughs> so if we put this in, it will sink. So it's going to sink again. So now let's put salt, a lot of salt. And all the salt represents and all the holiness, holiness we have in ourselves. And if we put the egg in, it will float. Hopefully. Okay. <laughs> you can't see it. You can't see it. Yeah, right. Okay, I'm <laughs> stirring again. us going into the hands of sin, and this represents us floating up out of sin, out of Satan's hands, and into God. Okay, so, what are some foods that are um, better tasting with um, salt? Does anybody know? Steak. Steak, yes. Fries. Fries, yes. Anybody else? Eggs. Eggs? <laughs> <laughs> Chicken nuggets, yes, but that's better with ketchup. Okay, okay so this is the verse Matthew 5, 13 to 16. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out or trampled under foot. Okay, so Christians like salt are of great value. Christians like salt are preservative and decay around us in the world. Christians like salt are to add zest, flavor, excitement to the world. Christians like salt are to make people thirsty for living water. Christians like salt help promote healing. Okay. Like salt, we preserve, we help offset the decay, the decay in morals around us. Like salt, we add flavor difference that people can notice. Like salt, we make people thirsty for the water and play. Like salt, we bring others into wholeness and healing though through Christ. We make a difference, not only by our presence and actions, but also by words. Colossians 4, verses 5 to 6. If we make or are not making a difference in the world, what use are we Christians? The reason God doesn't take us straight to heaven is because
because he wants us to make a difference here as Christians. As Christians. It, if we then the world, but there is no difference between us and the world around us, we have lost our saltiness. If people cannot see the difference God has made in our life, we have lost our saltiness. We have no, no positive influence on others. We have lost our saltiness, so that let's make a good difference and a good example to others. Let's be salty. So we need a, we need a volunteer. You in the place.
like Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, WhatsApp, iMessage, Google Plus. I know people get bullied a lot on social media and that's not good. I know none of us do anything bad on social media and some people do that stuff, but like still. It's really bad. You see, we're getting a little uneven here. We're not balancing our thoughts. How many of you have siblings? A lot of you, that's good. How many of you did something and put the blame on them? That's okay. Well, you see, this book, Sisters, okay. think it's wrong to be famous. Good, none of you. It's not wrong to want to be famous. But if we use that time of fame and put it in front of God and think more of ourselves, that's not good. Now we all look. Katy Perry. You might think, well, why Katy Perry? Well, when she was 13, she was, she's a guitar. <laughs> Alright, with all these bad thoughts, we are crushed. This is why we need God in our lives to keep us balanced. Luke 6, verse 45. The good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth what is good, and the evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth what is evil. For his mouth speaks from which fills his heart. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, first, I would like to start off with a quick quiz. It's a very easy one. So, I have a few logos and I want you guys to guess what company they are. Good job. Sprint. What is that? Sprint. Sprint. Thank They want to be the best of the best, or they just want to stand out and be known by other people. Just like all these companies have logos, or the way we remember them by, we also have logos. We could be the smartest kid in this class, or the class clown. We could be the quietest, or the most disobedient. We could be anything. Even Jesus had labels. He was called Son of God, Messiah the Christ, um, King of Jews, and much, much more. But label, these labels are given to him by others around him. For God, Jesus did not seek glory, fame, riches, or powers of this world. Even if he had great powers, like he performed miracles, with, like turning water into wine, making the lame walk, light the blind sea, or even feeding the 5,000 with only a few loaves and a couple of fish, he did not seek that glory or the thing, but and he was not concerned with having it. He just wanted to make he made himself a servant. For Mark 10, 45 says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve others, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus was here to serve us, but not to be served by others. He did not want the fame or the riches. He came to serve Service. He lived his life in a way he wants us to live our lives. Kids, even at school, like Inya said, we don't have to be the popular kid at school. We could just do what we want and just help others if the kids are in struggle of schoolwork. Or for grown-ups, when you're at work, even if you make, a, you do something that's really tough and accomplish your goal, um, let that not take the best of you and let you fall into the world with desires. Just continue to do what you're supposed to do and um, serve God and serve those around you. So in all our lives, we should not strive for glory or fame, but we should serve others in our heavenly thought.
Okay, so this is a grown-up circle this time. Okay, so first I need one volunteer. And it should be an adult. Or I'm going to go. I'm going to have two volunteers. <laughs> This uh, cup. Uh, yeah. I didn't tell you It smells like a <laughs> Tough times, it 
can be purchased by, but we should still do it. Like, for example, in the story of Joshua, God told Joshua you should walk around the wall of Jericho for seven days and the wall of the last. So it wasn't easy for Joshua to go to the people and tell them that you have to walk around the wall for seven days with me, and God said that the wall will stop. But Joshua trusted God anyway, and he did it. And so at the end, there was a good outcome, the wall collapsed. And also, Vanilla team once told us this story. It was about a man who was climbing a mountain. So it got dark outside, so he fell off the mountain, but the string still held him up. So since the string still held him up, he, he just kind of hung there for a while. And then he prayed to God, asking him, God, what should I do? So God said, cut the rope. And he kind of thought twice about that, and then he kind of decided not to cut the rope. And then when morning came and he could see the light, he thought that he could call someone for help. But then he found out that he was only 10 feet off the ground, and if he had just cut the rope like God told him, he would have been safe. But he didn't, so he didn't have a good outcome. Yeah, so we should never be discouraged in our faith or trust towards God, no matter what, because there are people or things in this world that can discourage you from your faith or trust towards God. Yeah. Now I guess it's my turn. So today I was given an opportunity to talk about something that is really close to my heart, and it often bothers me a lot. So I'm going to ask you a rhetorical question, and just answer it and be honest in your mind. So if I were to ask you, why do you pray? What would you answer in your mind? Would you say, it's just because I want to talk to God? Or maybe would it be, I need to share my days with God? Like you, I was taught at a really early age to talk to God so he can teach me stuff I didn't know. But honestly speaking, what is your opinion on prayer? Do you think of it as a chore? Or do you just merely enjoy doing it? Do you do it cheerfully? Or do you resent against it? First Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18 says, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. According to the generation today, prayer is underrated. A lot of people think prayer is senseless. And yes, I mean senseless. What people fail to understand is that prayer has infinite power. Why is it that we struggle a ton to talk to God? Do you find it difficult to talk to your friends? I really hope not. God is our friend too. Thus, we should be com comfortable to talk to him. Prayer is technically how we connect with God. Just because God knows the past, present, and future doesn't mean we shouldn't tell him what we want. If he thinks we need it, he will give it to us. We just need to be persistent in prayer. Let me connect that thought with this story, more like a witness. When I was in kindergarten, I often felt like I wanted someone to play with at home. I often felt lonely at, like, at home, too. That's when I started to pray for a sibling. Sometimes I felt discouraged, as though God wasn't answering me, or I felt God wasn't really, I thought God wasn't really looking at me, and he didn't hear me often. Even though I had these thoughts, I believed and kept praying. That's how I was blessed with Hanson when I was in fourth grade. So that was a big thing for me, and I felt really happy that God had listened to me, to my prayer. Sometimes people say they don't pray because they gave up hope or that they felt discouraged. According to Jeremiah 29, 12, we need to pray. That's when God listens to us and our thoughts. Prayer is often underrated because people think that they need a specific time, like in the morning or in the afternoon, or better vocabulary. Their mentality is something like God would only listen to them if they were literate and proper. The truth is no. God just wants us to come to him as we are. He doesn't want us to use vocab that only scholars use. 
He just wants us to be ourselves and talk to him. A lot of people who don't believe in the power of prayer haven't really witnessed its amazing power. They don't really understand the concept of continuous prayer. It's either that or God simply thought it wouldn't be best for them. I mean, who knows what God's plan is. Prayer doesn't simply work on its own. We need to work for it. If you want something, you can't just pray and then just sit around without doing anything. Let me tell you a short illustration I read in a magazine a while ago. In a school, they were holding a raffle. The winner would get to hold the flag and lead the Republic Day March at that school. And that is like a really big thing. Obviously, everyone wanted it. There was no exception to a little boy named Kay, short form for Chris. He prayed to God saying he wanted to, he would do anything to win that raffle. A week passed by as this continued. Finally, the day for announcing the result arrived. Kay was confident that he would win since he had prayed. The administrator announced the name of the kid, but to his dismay, it wasn't Chris. Chris was really upset and questioned God. God answered him calmly saying, Son, you didn't even buy a ticket. How could you win if you didn't buy a ticket? Like Chris, there are some believers. You need to work hard for anything, really, like even if you need to go to good college and you need good grades and stuff. I would like, with this, I would like to conclude that prayer is powerful and it's really important.
this made the people of the synagogue very mad. Because pretty much Jesus just told them that you're not the most important to God. But, and then they get really mad. But then Jesus gives, brings two incidents from the Old Testament to show that God never really favored them. And that he also did miracles and wonders for the Gentiles. So one was Elijah, which he would have sent to the widow in Sidon. And the second one was Elisha, when he healed a leper from Syria. Now at the time, leprosy was considered a reflection of your spiritual condition. So that's why in Deuteronomy 28, it says to go to a priest if you have leprosy, instead of a physician, because they thought a priest could cure you. So when he told them that Elijah had healed this leper from Syria, he was essentially saying that Syrians in general could be cleansed of their sin, and that they could also obtain eternal life. And this applies to everyone, not just the Israelites. So this angered the people of the synagogue even more. So they tried to push Jesus, someone they had known since he was a child, off a cliff. It seems that they did this on um, We need to appreciate our class kids and the uh, um, ministry, Sunday school ministry. Shall we give them a big applause?